And here we go. Welcome, Lauren Bucus. Thank you for joining us on Women's Day on Life in a Garden online. Thanks so much, Mandy. It's fantastic to have you. I've wanted to chat to you for a very long time about your, your work and uh, what goes through your mind. <laughs> Before we get into that, excuse me, Mark, not now. Thank you. Uh, before we get into that, won't you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, wow. Okay. I'm a writer. I've written five novels, a short story collection, some graphic novels slash comics, if you want to be less pretentious about it. Um, I went to UCT. I was a journalist for a very long time, and then I worked in TV as well and in animation. Um, and I've been really lucky to see my work travel so far across the world. I'm translated into 24 different languages. That is There's, fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, and they're turning The Shiny Girls into a TV show with Elizabeth Moss, uh, which is really exciting. But that's also news I've been sitting on for a year that I haven't been allowed to talk about. Um, oh, wow. Imagine sitting on news like that. You must Ooh. be bursting at the seams to tell the world. Absolutely. Um, but also worried that I would jinx it if I did. And I'm the mom to an 11 year old kid who uh, she keeps me really on my toes. She's brutal and hardcore and um, very funny. <laughs> Lauren, you heard of a bit of an underlying accent. What is that? It's from traveling. Um, you know, I grew up in South Africa. I've always lived in South Africa. I spent maybe a year living in the States, but wherever I go, I find that I subconsciously pick up on other people's accents and I start trying to mirror them back at them subconsciously. It's a way of like, I desperately want to connect with people. And um, what happens is that, you know, when I was in Australia, everyone asked if I was Irish. And I was like, what? No, yeah, there's a bit of Irish in there. Most, but most people think I'm American. And I realized that subconsciously I was trying to do an Australian accent, but I'm so rubbish at accents that it was coming out Irish. Well, the Australians wouldn't know anyway, so it makes no difference. No. <laughs> Well, we so, won't, we you won't. Know, my, my accent is a bit of a mutant melange, the same way as my books are. You know, it's a, my, my accent is a big crossover. So where do these ideas come from? I mean, what goes on in your mind? Very strange mind. Like, I'm actually very chill and, like, lovely and good-natured. Um, and, yeah, it's just, it's a way of kind of tackling the big issues in the world. It's a way of dealing with, rage um, about the way the world is and looking at kind of all the social ills that were deviled with from racism to sexism to, you know, homophobia and, and using my novels as a way of unpacking some of the ways I feel about the world. And unfortunately, I don't have all the answers. I think what my books do is raise questions. Um, but I love playing with these big ideas. I love telling a really compelling, strange story. And it's always nice when I surprise myself along the way. Where did the idea for Shining, I mean, Shining Girls is, is the, your favorite book that I've read so far. I think I've read about Thank three you. and it, it definitely, that's the one that stands out for me. Um, where did that idea come from? Where, how do you like have a serial killer who travels through doors to different times? I, I don't know. I, you know, I talk about my, you know how there's the analogy of like, you, you have a memory palace and that's what happens in your mind. I don't have a memory palace. I have a crazy hoarder house and it's packed with like weird things like, I don't know, doll's heads or, you know, whatever it is. And I just go in there and I pick up stompies and I'm like, Oh, what's this? How does this go together? Um, so I, you know, I can't say that, you know, I sit and meditate every morning and wait for the ideas to flow through me. It's, <laughs> it's really just kind of picking, picking things up and like thinking about like what would be, interesting to play with. Uh, partly, you know, a serial killer came that I was so bored of serial killer narratives, uh, where the serial killer is this fascinating, intriguing, to tortured soul, you know, quite Byronic. And, and real serial killers are not like that. Real serial killers are wounded, pathetic, damaged little men um, who this is the most power that they have in the world. And I wanted to write against that. I wanted to write against the way that we depict female victims um, and the way we talk about femicide. And, you know, it's always about the sexy dead girls or it has to be something really horrific that happened for it to make the news. Um, and yeah, so, and time travel just kind of fell into that. I, I, don't, I don't know how, I don't know what my formula is. 
if I figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thanks. You'll get back to us on that. We'll get the memo at some point. Yeah. <laughs> when did they say Shining Girls would go into production? Um, they've got 12 weeks to write all the scripts. I spoke to the show, the showrunner yesterday. She's so lovely. Um, and it'll go into production next year after Lizzie Moss um, finishes oh. filming uh, The New Handmaid's Tale. So probably, it'll probably start production July next year. The new Handmaid's Tale. If the pandemic allows. Are you a big fan of Handmaid's Tale? Uh, I love the book. I found the series very brutal um, and it, it became too much for me. Like, I need some humor, I need some wit. I'm very well aware of the horrors in the world and I thought the book did it beautifully. The first season was great. I just didn't want to watch it anymore after that. It felt like being beaten with sticks. Um, but the same as The Walking Dead, it's just, endless relentless brutality and suffering and i'm like i there's enough of that in the real world i don't need that in my entertainment yeah the thing is uh, with a series like the walking dead at least with um what were we talking about what's it called the good wife the <laughs> yeah at least with the handmaid's tale you can see there's a possibility of an end but how does yeah. the walking dead end i mean do they wipe out all the dead the pandemic's in your blood you can't you know and just like how do you get rid of it uh so yeah, they need to find a way to actually like, you know, reverse yeah. the whole situation. Z Nation is much more entertaining, quite frankly. If you yeah, watch more like that. <laughs> do you like the the dark sort of kind of stuff as well? I do, um, but I've you know I've been watching a lot of um, I'm rewatching The Wire at the moment with my I housemate. Love the who Wire. Hasn't seen it before. Yeah. I know, and it's just so good, and it still stands up. And you know, even in the wake of this kind of um, you know, because the show Cops in the U.S. got cancelled recently and there's this whole wave, you know, wave of like action against police violence and police brutality. And even a show like Brooklyn Nine-Nine is kind of re-examining how it portrays cops and how it makes it seem like the cops are, should be in charge um, and should have all these powers and cops as heroes. But The Wire still stands up and it does, it's, it's so nuanced, it's so powerful, it really explores you know, the stupid bureaucracy, uh, the racism, the people stuck in these jobs, which they really, you know, hate sometimes or really love sometimes, but how they're hindered at every opportunity and how they can be brutal in that moment. Yeah, and you, you actually wonder what they have to put up with, you know, it, it pushes you to that point where you are going to be that brutal. You know, how many yeah. times can you, you know, you're pushing against the system all the time and you catch the guys, they get let out. And so what are you doing the job for? And I, I you know, from almost from the point, police's point of view, you can understand it to a large degree, but then is it necessary? Anyway, well, we're not here to know, talk just... about the policing system. We're here to talk about you, Lauren. Okay. <laughs> what is this about writing a book? I mean, are you psychic or something? Are you like writing a book about a pandemic that comes out when we have a pandemic? <laughs> it, it is either the best timing or the worst timing, but it's very weird timing. Um, cause I spent five years living inside this fictional pandemic that I kind of researched pretty well. Um, and to emerge out of that blinking as the book comes out into the real pandemic has been fairly horrifying. And there's been a lot of stuff I got wrong, you know, about, um, one thing, for example, in the book, uh, the virus, which kills all the men is called the human Kalgoa virus. And it's named for this town in Australia where it comes from. But apparently the World Health Organization doesn't name viruses for places to stop racism. Um, you know, so it's not called the China virus. It's not called, you know, it, it's the coronavirus or COVID. And yet so many um, so people was, refer to it as the Chinese virus. Yeah, those people are racist. <laughs> Don't tell them that because they'll disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> A virus that hails from China. Yeah, it's it's so. Where did the idea for a pandemic come from? I mean, what about if somebody said to you, well, are you copying Stephen King's The Stand? Uh, you know, they're always going to be like reiterations. There's a famous comic book, which people always mention to me. They're like, but did you know about Why the Last Man? I'm like, yes, I knew about Why the Last Man. It's not, you know, a plague novel or a novel about the end of men is not unique. It's not original. Even a time traveling serial killer has been done before. It's how you play out the idea. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, and, and also it's actually not a pandemic novel. It's a post-pandemic novel. I'm, I wasn't that interested in the pandemic. I was interested enough to get like, it's, it's a backstory. Um, what I was trying to do was get to a place in the world where all the men were dead or 99.9% .9 of them were. So there are 35 million survivors left in the whole world. Um, 
And that's what was kind of the interesting thing to me. And a plague seemed like the easiest way to do it. You know, I could, it could be magic, it could have been aliens, but a pandemic, I like to root my books in the real. You know, even though they might have as high concepts like time travel or, um, you know, woman only world, I, I want there to be some kind of real um, credibility. Um, and, and it needs to be relatable. It needs to feel like our world, but for this one thing. Your world doesn't seem to have degenerated into the chaos of, let's say, The Walking Dead or one of those. No, um, well, has... and sorry, sorry, sorry to the men amongst us, but sorry, guys, if you died tomorrow, we'd actually be able to figure it out. We'd, we'd be very sad. <laughs> we'd be very sad and we'd miss you terribly and we'd mourn you. But, you know, and there might be some hiccups. There are more uh, satellite technicians who are men. That's a very male-dominated field. So we'd have to upskill very quickly in particular areas, and maybe the GPS is going to be down for a bit. Um, but, you know, the world carries on. And I wanted to create a world where it's not The Walking Dead. It's not the end of the world. It's not the apocalypse. It's not the road. Um, society continues, and maybe it's a little frayed at the edges. Um, and also the power structures continue. So the patriarchy is still a thing. Because before it's a system of gender oppression, the patriarchy is a power system which works very, very well and has done for millennia. So why wouldn't women just step into those roles? Exactly. Um, but they seem to be taking one a bit more brutally than men do. I mean, uh, as the lady in the strip club says, dealing with male customers is far easier than dealing with female customers. Well, yeah, but they're not brutal like that. At the, at the strip club, like, you know, now the, the female clientele demand really good food, you know? Um, <laughs> you can't. But listen, if you go to the Grand in Joburg, the food there apparently is fantastic. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't been. Oh, well, um, we can, we can, uh, Kim's not here. We could have asked her. So <laughs> <laughs> talk about the research that went into writing the book. What sort of areas did you research? So I obviously researched how pandemics work, but that, was, that wasn't actually the most interesting thing. Um, I spoke to geneticists about designing a virus that would be vaguely plausible. I mean, it's, it's not very plausible. It's, a, you know, it's, it's a flu which turns into prostate cancer. Um, but we do have HPV, which turns in from, you know, uh, yeah, it's a cervical an STI, cancer. which can turn into yeah. cervical cancer. So, yeah. Um, and I specifically based on that because I didn't want, testosterone is very, like people have varying degrees of testosterone. Women can have very high testosterone. Um, and also um, uh, chromosomes are very complicated. You know, it's not just XX and XY, like it can be XXY, there are all kinds of combinations. So I was like, cool, I need to kill most of the men. This is the easiest way to do it. But I also interview people wherever I went and have conversations with people and um, kind of trying to help them, get them to help me imagine this world. And it might be a woman who was uh, attending the mining in Darwin. She's very high up in the mining industry. And I was like, what would happen to mining? And she said, oh, we just automate. We've been wanting to do that for like decades, but we haven't been able to because of the, of the unions. Um, or I'd speak to, I, w I, w I was on a ride along with Cape Town Metro Police for another project that I was doing. And I was talking to the cops that I was hanging out with. And it was a black woman and a white man. And, um, and I said to them, you know, and we're doing this quite hardcore. We're going through Manenberg and Bonte um, and you know, and into the, into the ganglands and they're like, oh, do you want to meet the leader of the Americans? Uh, we're, just, we're, you know, passing him by now. And it was, yeah, it was, that was a whole other thing. But I asked them, I was like, what would happen to gangsterism and drugs if all the men disappeared tomorrow? And they said, are you kidding me? They were like, Mama American, when she ran the Americans, she was more ruthless and more violent because she had more to prove. And actually that gang has calmed down a lot since she appointed her son-in-law to take over. Um, and the problems are the problems. They don't magically go away. And I think as South Africans, we're really aware of that, you know, like the, uh, the first democratic elections didn't magically solve centuries of oppression. Um, we're still living with those things today and it's ongoing. But I also did a road trip, which was really fun. I, I flew into the States. I was super jet lagged. I drove, you know, some of the distance that of the road trip that my, uh, my characters are on. Um, I stopped in Salt Lake City. I visited this really cool anarchist house um, and hang out with an ex-Mormon who took me all around and gave me the Exmo tour. And I went to Miami and um, met really interesting people there. In Atlanta, I hired my Uber driver, Anya, 
who was so cool and interesting. She was the person who picked me up from the airport. And I was like, I'm hiring you for the day to drive me around tomorrow. And, um, and then she featured she in the book, like, didn't she? Of, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, she, and we went to like one of the mega churches and I couldn't get in. You know, I was trying to tell people, oh, I'm writing a novel. I'd like to come and do some research. And they were like, no, you got to put in writing. We got to get this approved by the church leaders. And slightly unethical maybe, but like she phoned one of them and she, she was like, give me the phone. And she phoned one of the churches I had on my list. And she was like, I'm a student and I'm doing this paper on like all the good work that you guys do. And I really want to come in and, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can interview you about like the work that you're doing. And we got this amazing personalized tour. And, and the guy didn't even, he just ignored me blatantly. I was just like the weird person with blue hair accompanying her. Um, oh, heaven forbid you should walk into a church with blue hair. I know. But, <laughs> but then also, then also, uh, yeah. And then we went to the Claremont, which was this retired strippers club in Atlanta, um, which is actually quite famous. And um, yeah, and, and just really interesting, like cool adventures, but also really interesting conversations with people along the way. I have to go backwards. What's an ex-Mo tour? I mean, like... Uh, Ex-Mormon. Ex yeah, I know, but what, what is an ex-Mormon? How do you escape that and become... Oh, well, I, you know, I guess you just kind of grow out of it. Um, but yeah, so she, we went to go visit the temple. Um, well, you know, the, the parts of the temple that you can visit. They brought this crazy museum. Um, I didn't know this about Mormonism. Um, uh, and they they had these um, mannequins representing um, the Mayans who apparently were actually Israelites and they traveled across the sea in these uh, sea, uh, seed pods. Um, Must be one hell of a tree that made seed pods. To South America in seed pods and the Mayans and the Israelites of the same people, which was really interesting. Um, we're descended from Mayans by <laughs> Israel. Anyway, um, <laughs> what's an ex strippers club? Um, so, oh, sorry, not ex strippers, retired strippers club. So it's older women. Um, oh, they're, and, but they're no longer strips. So now what are they? they no, they like, do strip. So they still strip, but they're much older. They're kind of in their 60s. Oh, so um, it's for mature men. Or well, younger. yeah, or, you know, like we been there, a, whole, a whole bunch of people have been there. And it's, you know, I think it's um, the idea is that women can still be empowered and still be sexy, even, you know, well into much older age. Then Love kind of this home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mortified. I can still send you out to earn us a living. Fabulous. But you, have to go, but you, <laughs> you have to go to America because we don't have retired strippers clubs in South Africa <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> Should we start one? Lauren, yeah, you're, going we... to, you're going to start a new business here in this country. <laughs> It's hysterical. Okay, now it's now let's let's deal with our people on the run. You picked a fabulous religious cult to take them across America. Where did that come from? You know, that was always in the back of my head. And actually, the very first draft of the novel starts with the church. They're embedded in the church. They're hiding out, and these sisters are just nuts. You know, they wear. Um, these brightly colored robes with the word sorry printed all over them and like really loud prints. And they've got like a little veil across their mouths, which says sorry on it. And that's the speak, which speaks for you. Because the idea is that the church for sorrows believes that it's women's sorrows or sins, um, which brought about the end of men. It's God's punishment from on high because uh, we were not good wives. We didn't listen. We talked too much. We weren't obedient. Um, you know, we had opinions and, and if the Heaven church can just get enough people to repent, like then God will forgive us and bring back the men. So Cole and her son, Miles, who's disguised as Mila, uh, end up joining this church in a very low point of their lives, um, especially for Cole. And, um, and actually it's the perfect place to hide out because these people are so annoying. They're, they'll come up to you in public, you know, so now we've got a world of all women. So you're going about your business. You're, you know, at the VNA waterfront and suddenly like this neon nun comes up to you and she's trying to take your hand and she's trying to make you say sorry with her and say, repent with me, my sister. The word is sorry. Say it with me. And you're like, oh, don't talk to me. God, I'm just trying to go to Vita. And, um, and it's a perfect place to hide out unless the church realized that there is a boy in their midst, which is the answer to their prayers. And, you know, of course, you know, Cole's son, Miles, is 12. And they've been on the run. They've been through some hectic times, some trauma. They were doing all these experiments on them. Um, 
and like keeping them in this kind of luxury compound. And now, you know, he's trying to define himself outside of his mother. And the church is very seductive. You know, it's uh, the, the, the dogma that he's the chosen one, that he's Harry Potter um, is very alluring. And, and so that's another thing that Cole's going to have to deal with. And all the, all the, the sort of like little subplots that are surrounding them. Um, yeah. You know, your, your well, sister, who is your, now your enemy, and how your semen is now like a prized possession. I, I, I found that completely fascinating. You know, like uh, we're now venerating men because they're in short supply and um, lesbian relationships and I, I, all the things that you deal with. It's quite, it's quite a lot, shall we say, going on in that book. And it's not yeah. a small book. I mean, it's quite, it's a, it's a substantial, it's a substantial read. You've left, yeah. I don't, I, I don't want to. Well, okay. So, so to that point, like I was very interested in kind of gender flipping these ideas. So, you know, this idea that a world of women would naturally be a kinder, gentler place where we'd all be making each other friendship bracelets and having communal gardens. Hmm. Um, that, that idea comes from someone who hasn't met women. Um, because we're just as capable, amazingly, amazingly, we are fully human and we're just as capable of being assholes, of being selfish, of being greedy, of being violent, of, you know, falling headfirst into like corporate greed and being power hungry. Um, and, and I really wanted to kind of play with that, but I also wanted to gender flip this narrative of, you know, the teenage girl in danger and, you know, from the human traffickers. And we've got so much history of that. And I really wanted to like make men and and you know really look at that and be like oh my god here is a 12 year old boy who is being sexualized he's being objectified he's being hunted for his sperm the government's telling him what he can and can't do with his body um and and i really wanted to kind of flip that and also this idea that like being the last man on earth would be the best because all the ladies be all over you but but actually you know it's it wouldn't be nice it wouldn't be great um and I, I love the way that sport just went on, you know, like, well, we, we, yeah, you know, yeah, we're yeah. carrying on playing rugby and we're carrying on playing baseball. We just switched the teams around and women are getting more, you know, more airplay, which they didn't get before, you know. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the thing. The funny thing is um, my wonderful editor, Helen Moffat, who's like, you know, a, a deep feminist. She's one of like the leading experts on, you know, violence against women and femicide in this country and, you know, a super feminist, but she's not a sports fan. And she said to me, she's like, oh, and what will we use the stadiums for? Imagine. And I was like, maybe the women's teams, maybe Banyana Banyana would actually get major airplay. Maybe we'd actually be able to go and watch them. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I have a niece who, um, when she was younger, she was a fantastic uh, left-footed football player in the UK. And she was asked to play for the Arsenal under, under nines or under tens team. Yeah. And she didn't pursue, she played for a couple of years, but she didn't pursue mm -hmm. a game in football specifically because the women are not paid. Yeah. You know, like the men are paid. Um, yeah. They get about a 15th of the salary that male players get. So there's no, specifically no gender equality in, in that kind of field mm -hmm. to start with. So if, yeah. I mean, if you think that suddenly there's no more men, hello. Absolutely. You know? Yep. Um, Although there is a lot of nostalgia in the book as well, you know, and a lot of people are watching the old like movies, you know, with, you know, kind of real macho men or, or also like watching old like American football matches, like just on repeat. Um, yeah. But could you imagine a world without Gerard Butler? Oh, it'd be terrible. Or Idris Elba or, yeah, you know, I just, I think that's so, or, you know, my brother or my dad or. I haven't thought about them. They're just family. <laughs> I already have a world without my brother and my dad, so we just carry on. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Eleanor. <laughs> um, Lauren, I'm getting sidetracked. Your book ends in a very nice place. Could there no be spoilers. Second? Could there be a second book? Maybe. I don't know. I, I tend to, I've never written a sequel yet. Um, but right now we are having conversations about the, the film rights. Um, mm. So I think yeah, the film writes people, on a book like this would be fantastic. I'd actually like to see this as a film. Um, yeah, no, it has all the right elements, you know, the South Strip in Miami, a little bit of Joburg, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I, I think that would be I mean, military camps, G.I. Jane. Yeah. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, no, totally. Absolutely. Talk to us about the cover. 
So the cover is the first cover, which isn't done by my, in South Africa, by my longtime friend, um, who's been my cover designer since my first book, uh, Dale Halverson. Um, but he's moving in more into writing these days. So it was done by another friend of mine, Anya Fenta. And I just absolutely loved it. It's like really just gorgeous and playful. And I love, they wanted, uh, the publisher wanted a very kind of strong image, like Naomi Alderman's The Power with that hand with the kind of, electric circuits through it. Um, so they want something like really iconic and simple. And she and I were looking at my proofs for the American edition and they had this flower bomb uh, on the kind of opening pages. It was just like a little graphic element. And she's like, that's what we should have is a flower bomb, which also references the American cover, um, wait, which I can show you. Hello everyone. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the American cover which is a plastic rose. So it's a, you know, it's not a real rose. It's not a real boy and not a real girl. Um, and yeah, I think they actually work really well together. They, there's, they're kind of in conversation, which I love. Um, I prefer ours, I have to tell you. I do prefer ours. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I always prefer ours. The South African covers are my favorite. And on the back, you know, the, the uh, because it's a grenade, so it's waiting to explode. And on the back, it has exploded. It actually has exploded. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Somebody asked who the killer is going to be in Shining Girls. Have, have he been? Oh, caught? I don't know. I have no idea yet. Um, Do you have any I don't, anybody in mind? Yeah. Personally? Because I mean, he can't um, be Shining heroine, uh, hero type guy. So no Gerard Butlers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It could be. Like you could have, I mean, you could have someone playing against type. You know, the way Charlize like kind of ugly up for monster. You could have Gerard Butler kind of, you know. Packing it on a bit. But, yeah, but I think you probably don't want someone that famous. I think you want someone who's kind of more, um, because Harper does also fade into the background. You know, people don't really remember him. He's not like the swoony, handsome guy. Um, I think he's kind of rangy and, you know, gaunt and just has a real, um, there was this. Who's that guy with movie? the movie? Uh, Cardinal Sins. Was it called Cardinal Sins? Where he's in jail and he's in. Kills the he kills the cardinal. Do you remember that movie? I haven't seen it. No, you have. It's a hundred years old. Everybody's seen it. Can't remember. <laughs> but he's the, the the same guy that was in Citizen was in Citizen X where he, on the pavement. Oh god, no, I can't think. That's a scene in a movie I've never forgotten. I actually need to check it out of my head right now. Edward Norton. Edward Norton. Oh yeah. Yeah, you could do an Edward Norton. You could do like a less famous Ethan Hawke. Um, yeah. Okay, loving that, loving that idea. And who do you, Cole, she's a very strong woman. Mm. She's a, she's, but also she makes terrible mistakes. Like she's not, you know, she's, she's on human. the run, she's frantic. I think she talks about parenting as being the worst game of improv ever. Um, and, and she's not a Linda Hamilton, you know, she's not there with her muscles and her guns. She's just a mom who's really trying to do her best. Um, and there's a ferocity to motherhood as well, I think. Um, and it, yeah, it so, comes out in her. It certainly comes out. I mean, this yeah. this um, post-apocalyptic lifestyle has turned her into something she really wasn't. You know, like starting uh, learning how to fix cars and motor engines, yeah, and totally. having to step into those roles has turned yeah. her into something that she was. And then fighting for her cub, you know, being Absolutely. separated from him and only being allowed access to him, you know, a couple of hours a day, yeah. because the government is now in control. It, it, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, and I, you know, and I wasn't interested in writing like a Linda, Linda Hamilton type character. Like she is someone who, you know, she was a paper artist. Um, you know, she used to make window displays for, you know, Woolworths essentially. Um, and you know, and some small time exhibitions, but she wasn't anyone who had useful skills. And, you know, I think there's also, I remember when I got divorced about six years ago, um, there were things that I couldn't do that were really, there were really dumb, small things. Like I couldn't change the uh, HDMI cable at the back of a TV because I'd never had to because, you know, my husband took care of it. And I couldn't open a bottle of champagne and I couldn't make a fire because he used to do those things. And it was so empowering to me after I got divorced to be like, now I'm like the boss of making fires and the boss of like opening champagne, which is a skill I wish I could use more these days, but you know. But unless you're sitting on a stock of champagne, you don't have a... No, I'm not. I, don't even have, I didn't even have one bottle to like celebrate the US release, which was two weeks ago. I'm sitting with a similar problem at the moment. I have a lampshade in front of me with a broken bulb. 
And do you think that I can find the pliers in this house? Because you need thick enough pliers to push it down without, because the, the globe is broken. So you yeah. can just to grip it without ripping your hand open. And I have struggled yeah. for about an hour to get this thing right. So now I'm going to have to quit a man. What a terrible yeah. idea. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, you could just get a paid professional. Um, no, that's just, oh, no, no. Yeah. No, no, no. I'll ask Martin when he comes on Tuesday and he'll moan about it. He'll moan about it for the first half an hour before he actually, like, you know, like, oh, I've got a headache. I don't think I can do it. I mean, I actually want to slap him at that point, you know. Um, Lauren, what are you working on now? Or are you still taking a little bit of a break between books? Or was there something cooking in between? I'm taking a little bit of a break. Um, but I'm also, I started work on a new novel, but I don't want to talk about it too much because it's... Um, it's very fresh and you can actually, you can talk a project to death. Um, you know, it's this tiny little seed and you're still waiting to kind of see what it's growing into. And if you talk too much about it, it's like overwatering it. Okay. Here's a great question. Hi Lauren. Yeah. I'm always interested in the writing process. How do you write a book? Are you better in the morning or do you spend a whole day writing, etc.? Um, I try to avoid writing as much as possible because I find it very difficult and very lonely. Um, so it's basically, I have to have a meaningful deadline, um, you know, where my publishers can say, well, you have to pay back the advance and we're like never going to publish you again. <laughs> um, so, you know, I actually need that to, to drive me because otherwise, you know, it, when I'm in flow, it's very enjoyable. And then it's like going down a water slide, but it's, you know, getting to flow is like that four hour long queue to get to the top of the water slide. Um, you know, if you're like one of the, one of those epic theme parks where you're just in the queue, in the queue, in the queue. Do you have a like a Excel spreadsheet with all your characters on and their look and what they're wearing and where they were and their date of birth and so yeah, you can no, chart I them? I use a software called Scrivener. Um, it's not too expensive. I think you get it for about forty dollars, and it has it's like the most wonderful way of writing and it, it organizes everything it has like a whole research section which you can just click and paste you can like open a window and have it hovering so you can like see the information that you've written down about the character you can import pdfs or videos so you can have all your research in one place and it also does a corkboard feature where it kind of um you, know, you can like have little chapter notes and you click and then it looks like it's on a corkboard and you can see the whole shape of your novel you can see which chapters still need to be written and I think the most useful feature it has is um, something called the snapshot. Because I know when I first started writing my first novel, which I wrote when I was 17, which is going to stay in a drawer forever, or I should probably just burn it now and get ahead. Um, it's, you know, I, I would, every time I change something significant, it would become, you know, draft 47B, the one where the monsters are, I don't know, whatever. Um, and then, and then you change something again, it becomes draft 47C part two, the one where the monsters are actually something else. Um, and Scrivener allows you to take a snapshot of something, so, and then make your changes, and, and you can have multiple snapshots of that, of that chapter. And you, know, you can have 50 versions of that chapter, and it's right here, and you can just click through it. And just being able to save that chapter and make the change, I actually never go back to those older versions, but just having them there and categorized and cataloged means I feel safe in making this big change. I can be like, no, actually this character needs to do this. Save, archive, and then just run with it. But the fact that I have that archive, you know, is really helpful. And your characters, do they speak to you? I mean, do you hear Cole talking to Mila? Uh, I mean, they don't speak to me in, in, you know, like where I can hear their voices in my head, but um, they do, there, there is a subconscious magic to writing where they do run away with themselves. Um, and always a character, you know, like for, I think I spent like a year and a half trying to make the bad guy in this book a man. And first it was the baby daddy who Cole like still, you know, she had his child, but wasn't in contact with him. And oh, so hard to explain. Um, and he was just like vile and evil. And then it was her dumbass brother who was like, what's the big deal? It's just a little bit of sperm. And I was like, why is this book centered around men? Like, why is this, you know, the bad guy has to be a woman. And Billy, the sister was waiting in the wings and she like just came out and she's like, finally, are you kidding me? I've been waiting so long. Of course I'm supposed to be the bad guy, you idiots. I'm like, oh God, yes, of course. 
And I'd had that inkling, but as soon as I started writing her, she just came on so hard and so strong. I had her voice immediately um, and it was great. It's not, I don't hear voices in my head, but like there is the subconscious magic. You know, if you've ever done a drawing, you know, sometimes things will change between the moment that you put pen to paper and it comes out like slightly differently. And I think that is the magic of art is that we're not in complete tight fisted control. And Billy's really a sorry kind of character, isn't she? I mean, she's really just a messed up, really not nice human being. No, no, she's an awful narcissist. She's, you know, and one of my editors said to me, they were like, oh, well, you know, what was the, what was the formative reason why she turned out that way? And I was like, sometimes there isn't a formative reason. Sometimes people are just assholes. Um, and she's so self-involved and she's so selfish. And she only wants to see things her way and, and everything is done to her. Um, you know, she doesn't want to take any responsibility. She's just suffering constantly at the hands of other people. And, you know, and how dare they, how dare they do this to her? And it was actually quite, it was really fun to write because the amount of certainty that she has in her life, you know, being this awful narcissist, being so self-centered, but being so certain that other people have like hurt her and have wounded her and it's their fault was really liberating because that's not the way I feel in my life, you know, like, and it's not suddenly the way Cole is. Like Cole is full of self-doubt. She's constantly second guessing herself and is she making the right decision? But she has to like, just decide and like, you know, and maybe sometimes she has to double back and try to fix things. But Billy's just like, you know, straight Arab. She knows exactly what she wants and she knows that everyone has thwarted her. And, and that was really, it was, it was quite a liberating headspace, even though she's a complete awful human being. In terms of plotting your books, do you know, I mean, do you sit and work out where it's going right from the beginning or is it quite an organic process? Um, it's, it is quite organic, um, but it, it's both actually. Um, people always talk about, are you a plotter or a pantser? As in, do you fly by the seat of your pants? Um, so I know where I'm, I'm starting from and I know where I'm going to. Um, there's a great analogy about, uh, I think it was E.L. Doctorow who said it's like taking a road trip at night. You know where, you, you know, you, you know your departure point, you know your destination, but the rest of the time you're just trying to stay on the road and you can see 20 feet ahead of you in the headlights. And I always thought that was really beautiful. Um, but it's also a bit like excavation. It's like being on a dinosaur dig and, and you're pretty sure like this is kind of the T-Rex skull. Um, and, the, and that this is going to be a T-Rex, but you also have to do some excavation and digging to like kind of see what comes up as well. If they are really big teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask Lauren? I'm busy, you know, hogging the entire conversation here. And the only question we've had is from Mike. Lauren, did you base your religious cults on anything in particular? on any one sort of religion or was there something out there that sparked your interest or do you just thought, I think a nun in a ultra pink get up would look fabulous habit. That's the word I wanted. Yeah, I actually, it was, um, their habits were inspired by, um, Amber Rose wore a slut dress a few, gosh, my, must have been seven, seven years ago. And she wore like this because people have been calling her like really filthy names. I don't really know who Amber Rose is. I think she's a model and I think she's somehow peripherally associated with the Kardashians. But she wore this bright Lumo dress with like these luminous words saying slut or like printed all over her. Um, so that's kind of, I was like, okay, what if that was a nun's habit and it said sorry instead of slut? Um, that'd be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I, there wasn't you know, a particular, it's really just kind of the misogyny in the Bible that I was playing with. And, you know, the, this very literal reading of the Bible, I'm obviously an atheist, um, but I don't, you know, if, whatever your faith is, that's totally up to you. Um, but I did grow up like, you know, in the Rosebank Interdenominational Church up until I, you know, until I was about 12. So, you know, I had a lot of kind of Christian back, backdrop. I went to an Anglican school. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to play with a different kind of end of the world cult um, where it was just kind of very self-flagellating, which I think is also something women do, right? Is we punish ourselves um, and we blame ourselves. And so I wanted to be able to play with those kind of riff off those elements. Who were your literary inspirations growing up? 
Um, I read a lot of fairy tales and mythology. Um, my mom got me into fantasy. My dad got me into science fiction. Um, sure. You know, now I'd say, you know, some of my favorite writers include people like um, N.K. Jemison, William Gibson, David Mitchell. Um, Jennifer Egan is just phenomenal. I love her. I love Karina Russell. I, I look for books that will take me somewhere. I, I think a book is a house that you can inhabit for a while. It's a, it's a whole other life that you can fall into. And I really want that to be surprising and interesting. I don't want kind of the, the safety of knowing what's coming. Um, I want to be surprised and I want to, I want to feel like this just swept away. So no reading Lee Child for you? No, I, you know, I bought this, I bought this thriller. It was like so highly recommended. It wasn't Lee Child, it was something else. And I got three pages in and I was like, I cannot read this. The writing is so bad. It's just terrible. Which is not to say there aren't smart, hard thrillers, but this was not, this was not that one. I can recommend The Farm by, um, gosh, what's her first name? Somebody, Ramos. Um, and it's very cool. And like South Africans will like, it'll really resonate with us. Um, because it's about, um, I mean, they might even be doing this. I don't think it's even a sci-fi concept. I think this is fully credible and realistic right now where these um, Filipino women who would normally be nannies in New York get approached to be surrogates and they get taken to the farm and it's this luxury farm where you have to like kind of, you know, you're monitored and you have to eat all these nutrients prepared for you by chefs, but it's also quite oppressive and interesting. Um, so it's another it was, version it of The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, absolutely. But but in a much more kind of realist sense of, and, and it's written by a Filipino woman and that makes all the difference because you really kind of get the real understanding, the real texture. But, you know, for all of us who've had nannies and domestic workers and, and couldn't have had our careers without those people um, who are also so crucial to the economy, it's it was also, yeah, it felt very close to home. Dave says, Scrivener is brilliant. I love it that often reality is less than believable fiction. Do you imagine your reader or do you, do you write? Who do you write for, rather? I write for me. Um, and I hope that there are other people like me. Um, you know, and maybe I'll be writing for my friends. But I, I just, uh, I'm telling a story that I find interesting to tell. Um, I don't think, oh, this will be so commercial. And if I add in this, that will be, you know, that'll like really hook, I don't know, the British readers. I don't know. You know, I... And it's interesting to see who my readership is because I have quite a cross section of readers. You know, I have a lot of kind of hard sci-fi male readers and I have, um, you know, like uh, hardcore crime readers who love me. And it's just really interesting to see that kind of cross section where I kind of, I managed to play somewhere in between where I can be a little bit literary, a little bit crime, a little bit kind of SF or fantasy uh, or horror. And it's always interesting to me when the reviews come out and how they brand the book. I'm like, oh, right, Broken Monsters is a horror. I suppose I can see that. Um, but it's not what I set out to write. I'm not like, okay, now I'm going to write a commercial horror. That's also a police detective novel. Um, yeah. What about people like Clive Barker and Raymond E. Feist in terms of um, reading? Yeah, I mean, I read, I read Raymond E. Feist growing up and same with um, David Eddings and um, Stephen King. Uh, did never really go into Clive Barker, although the Hellraiser movies were like really creepy and amazing. Um, His other stuff yeah. like um, I Magica and Weave World are just phenomenal. You should you actually do them? yourself. Weave World is a, okay. about a world in a carpet that's rolled up. Oh, wow. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah I, I, love, I love high concept ideas. I love like strangeness. Like, like tell me something new. Show me something. Yeah, well, then, then read his other books. Don't, don't read the horror books. Read the fantasy books because he, he really mm -hmm. writes. I love his work. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, of all, the, I, of all the fantasy books there are, I sold my entire fantasy collection. I have probably about a thousand. I sold the whole lot, but I wow. collect, kept his. His are the books that I, that I actually kept. So yeah. apart from my South African author's collection, um, <laughs> his books are on my shelf. I just moved right. house, a three-bedroom house into a two-bedroom apartment. And I got rid of most of my books and, and it was gutting. It was also interesting to see which ones I kept. Um, but it also felt like I was kind of sharing the love with other people. You know, I, I, I got my friends and I was like, listen, here are some places you can donate. Just donate whatever you want. Take as many books as you want. Just get them out of my house. 
Um, but I've already had like a lot of people coming back to me and they're like, oh, that was amazing. And like, you've got such good taste. And I really didn't expect anything from this one, but wow. I'm like, and it's great. It's, it feels like, it feels like I'm handing out, I'm sharing my crack, you know, <laughs> getting other people addicted. Well, reading is addictive. And I think people who don't yeah. read really miss out a lot. What, what advice would you give to any aspiring writer? Finish the damn book. Um, you know, uh, part of the problem with Motherland, the uh, Afterland, the reason it took me so long was because I kept doubting myself and I kept going back to the beginning. Um, and, and I call it, I call it um, wheel spinning in the parking lot on the motorcycle of doubt. So you got to stop wheel spinning in the parking lot. You got to like head out on the open road. You've actually got to get to the destination. You know, stop, stop doing donuts, stop showing off in the parking lot. It's not helpful. Five years. So has there been a break between your last book and this book of five years? Yeah. Six, six years for, to publication. Yeah. That is um, quite a long, that is quite a long haul. Absolutely. But you know what? I was getting divorced. I was rebuilding my life. I had, I released a short story collection. We re-released Maverick with updated stuff. I had a horror comic come out. Um, because there was a lot of other stuff going on. It's not like you were just researching one book and, and thinking, no. well, I won't do anything else in the meantime. I'll just, you know, rest on my laurels, shall I? But I am in the lucky position where I am a full-time writer, you know, that I can do this full-time, that I actually make enough money because I have international deals. Um, because my books have been able to travel, that, that means that I can actually do this. I don't have to have a day job. Um, How did you crack it? Or was it just sheer luck? I mean, for, for your books to be syndicated into 24 different languages, made into movies, yeah. that's one hell of a leap for a South African writer. It's just, it's, it's one in a million, shall we say. You know, I always want to self-deprecate like crazy and say, well, I was just really lucky. But you know what? I worked fucking hard. Excuse my language. No, that's um, okay. <laughs> but I worked really, really hard. Uh, and, you know, I think I have a distinctive voice. Um, so it's, but it's, I'd say it's like 10% talent, 10% luck, and 80% just blood, sweat, and tears. You know, I struggled to get Moxieland published. Um, I had a whole bunch of rejections. It was incredibly painful. Uh, it disappeared almost without trace, and then it got picked up internationally um, by this publisher that I'd been keeping an eye out for, um, that I heard about, and I, I insisted my agent send it to him. Um, and yeah, and then Angry Robot, it was a two-book deal, and they were like, well, you know, what else do you have in mind? I was like, I've got this kind of weird book about a girl with a sloth on her back, and they were like, cool, sounds good. Um, and yeah, and and that because that won the Arthur C. Clarke Award, um, that, that changed everything for me. And then I had this very sexy idea about a time traveling serial killer, which is actually a way of talking about violence against women and the loops and mistakes of history, which come up again and again. You know, a bit of a Trojan horse. I think all my, I think all my books are a bit of a Trojan horse. Um, Why well, I asked you earlier if you have any kind of like psychic ability, because I, th I think it's Moxieland where you talk about transferring money to a phone and yet banking apps hadn't even, you know, become a reality yet for, I think for another five or 10 years. Maybe not it was that really long. kind of looking. It was looking at what was happening already, and I was looking at how addicted I was to my phone and how my phone was slowly becoming my whole world. So I was just kind of tracing that trend. Um, but you know, I was looking at Moxie Land again recently. I haven't reread it in years, and I was doing a talk for uh, the at the American School via Zoom, and and in the first chapter, there's talk about a pandemic in 2018. I'm like, oh. <laughs> So if you want to talk about my, my prescient book, that was actually the one. Um, so that was the, the precursor. What is it? If yeah. The prequel to this one. Absolutely. Okay. And the rural areas are just like in desperate, in desperate trouble. And like there's kind of an, an apartheid system where you have to have a passport to come in from the rural areas to come into the cities. Um, and I was like, oh, wow. Um, okay. Well, I hope we don't go that way. Um, yeah. The more things change, the more they stay the same, Lauren. Yeah. If there are no other questions for Lauren, I think I'm going to let her go. People, what do you think? Anybody else got a question? Dave, Eleanor, Davina, this is your chance. Mike, one for the road, because you're my man oh, of fantastic that. questions. <laughs> Isn't he gorgeous? Oh. <laughs> it's a brand new puppy. Oh. Yeah, sorry, this is Seamus. He's being an absolute bugger throughout the call. Um, oh. But he's, so cute. yeah, he's gorgeous. <laughs> He's giving my other two bullies a run for their money. Ah! And he bites like crap. <laughs> yeah, little puppy teeth are very sharp. Aren't they fantastic? Sharp, yeah. But 
and he's as mad as a bull terrier should be. Oh, perfect. Head down. I've, I've sworn off of puppies. No more puppies in this house. Yeah, Only two year old and over. Yeah. <laughs> two year old and over. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren, it's been nice. heard a few nice comments. Are there any more comments? Because I'm, oh, sorry, there's a comment. There's a comment quickly. I love nice. you. Thank you, Gerda. We loved talking to Lauren as well, didn't we? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Lauren, we love the blue hair. You are an Thank inspiration. You. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? Any other parting shots? Anybody else want to tell Lauren how fabulous she is before we let her go? I do. I just want to say, don't make it six years. I'm reading Afterland really slowly so that, uh, you know. Thank you. I appreciate that. Because some uh, people, because some people like have read it in one day, and I'm like, do you not understand? That took me five years to write. How dare you read it in one day? So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just like yeah, I'm reading it very slowly because, well, yeah, it's just it's it's such a good book. I'm really enjoying it, but I am a big fan from Roxy Land right the way up and Survivors Club and all the rest uh, of it as well. Cool. So yeah, awesome. so I appreciate it. It's a really great book, and yeah, don't make it six years, please. I know, I know. I mean, I can't afford to either. I actually need to, like, for my for sake of my career, I need to, like, actually, yeah. Well, uh, Mike, come to the party with another question. Thank you, Mike. Have you met one writer that you were a huge fan of in particular? Um, actually, met him or read him? Uh, I think you're talking about meeting, meeting someone. Um, so William Gibson was amazing. Uh, we became Twitter friends, and then I got to meet him in London. Um, you know, I become friends with some writers, but I, I wasn't necessarily a huge fans of their work beforehand. Or I didn't, you know, I hadn't read their stuff. Like Naomi Alderman, who wrote The Power, we're friends now. I couldn't actually read The Power when it came out because I was like, oh, it's a little too close to my book. I don't want to be unduly influenced. Um, I've seen Margaret Atwood present, but I didn't get to meet her. Um, and I went to, again, a Twitter friend, Joe Hill, is a really great kind of horror and science fiction writer. He wrote Lock and Key, which is on Netflix at the moment. That's Stephen King's um, on. It's Stephen King's son, and I was invited to his wedding, and I took my friend Sarah Lotz, who's also a novelist. Ah, another horror novelist, and, yes. Yeah. And it was at the Globe, and, um, and Stephen King is his dad, so he, he said, oh, Lauren and Sarah are here. Bring them over. I want to meet them, because he's blurred both our books. So, you know, it was like this very godfather moment where we got summoned to his table, but he was just so sweet and lovely, and he and his wife, Tabitha, were like just tearing up the dance floor, and it was just really cool. Um, and that's been, it's been amazing to like, just have those kind of encounters. Well, I think that's, that's incredible. An encounter like that is awesome to have met Stephen King yeah. and then Joe Hill. I mean, he is, he's especially changed his name so that he wasn't riding on his father's laurels and lock and key. I absolutely loved. So yeah. I'm looking forward to the, I'm looking forward to the next one. Definitely. Lauren, thank you. It's been absolutely spectacular. Happy woman's day. Thank you. And uh, like Davina said, please don't take another five years to write a book. We uh, expect <laughs> yes, one in at least two years, okay? Awesome. Thanks so <laughs> Everybody, much. Everybody, thank you so much. There's nothing tomorrow, but on Tuesday we start a week of books. Um, Sarah Key, Sean Fuchs, Taryn Lee, who have I left out? Karen Jennings. I can't remember. There's six. Oh, Sally Andrews. Silly me. How could I leave that out? Uh, but there are fab fabulous books lined up for next week. So please do join us. And then coming soon is Tony Park. And following that is uh, Jeremy Dronfield with the boy who followed his father into Auschwitz. And that's August is all about reading. Everybody, thank you so much. Enjoy your day off tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing so many of you on Tuesday. Go well. Bye.